No, in fact, my dad told me when I was 20, he read this article in the Sunday magazine that said um, between 20 and 40, uh, 20 year olds will have four careers. And he says that quote to me when I'm 20 years old, 30 years ago, by the way. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I bet you, like, I didn't have the term transferable skills in my head. Like, I didn't know that word. But I was thinking, like, I bet you they all kind of build off each other. Whoa, there could be something I do that doesn't even exist yet. Like, I actually had that, like, now, back in that time, things were not rapidly growing like they are today. But it still dawned on me. And so, yeah, very clearly, that was true for the first 20 years of my career. But in the last 10, wow. (laughs) Wow, you just kind of follow the path. And I also haven't really let go of my other um, careers. So my initial work was around networking in person, teaching people how to do that, teaching people how to design engaging events for conferences. Hey everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. I have a great resource for all authors. You're going to want to uh, get out your pen and paper and stop writing your book and take note because uh, Robbie Samuels is on the podcast Robbie's got a lot of great resources for you as a fellow author, but also someone who helps authors. So you're in the right place if you're looking for help with your next book. Robbie's here and he loves working with new authors. So listen up. You got a lot to learn here today. Robbie's in the house and excited to have him here. Robbie, welcome to the podcast. Uh, This is my favorite intro yet. (laughs) This is awesome. Thanks, Dave. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. Well, hey, uh, yeah, my coffee's kicking in, so it's all working. I love it. Uh, Robbie, tell everybody where you are in this big world of ours. I live north of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the northeast of the United States. Excellent. It's great to have you here. I'm on your website. It's gorgeous. Uh, There's a lot of content on your website, Robbie. You You are one busy person. Uh, how did all this start for you? Your love for writing, helping authors. There had to be a point in your life where you're like, this is my path. I know I'm, I'm where I'm headed. How did it happen? You know, for any of your listeners who do not yet identify as a writer, I'm still not sure that I do. And I have three published books. There you go. And I write a weekly email and create a lot of other written content. So it didn't start with my love of writing, it started because I wanted to help people better connect and engage at in-person events back when we didn't have to qualify them as in-person events. Right. <laughs> and I had a training a talk that I was doing called Art of the Schmooze, and it got developed over time. And I was it was years I was doing it, years and years. And I saw the opportunity to write a book about it. And I talked about that book for like two years, you know, a lot of false starts. And finally, I found the right support. And in four months, the book was written. The book is close to being done. And I'm, I'm, you know, again, sweating my way through the writing process, you know, figuring out how to, to, to get the time and get the focus. And, and I'm, I'm getting really excited, though, as I go, because I like the book. And that book is my first book, Croissants versus Bagels, Strategic, Effective and Inclusive Networking at Conferences, which was published in 2017. And when it was published, I, I was like maybe six to eight weeks before like it was being handed off to the editor. It was like really close to being handed off to the editor. I guess I was doing like another read through. And I thought, you know, I want people to read this book. This this is a good book. This isn't just like I was at first writing a book because as a speaker, it's good to have a book. So I was kind of writing a book in like a, yeah, I should write a book. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I really wrote a good book. This is a valuable book. I should tell people about this book. Well, I have to say, as much as I wasn't a fan of the writing phase, I loved the marketing part. So I actually paused the publication date because as a self-published author, I was able to do that and made a game plan. Uh, It took about six weeks to build a launch team. And I had a goal of getting 100 reviews by my launch day. Now, people should know that your publication day and your launch day are not the same thing. So I had a plan for between when I published and when I launched. So, well, that first time, I only had like three days between the two because I don't know why I did that to myself. It was a lot. It was much harder. Now I'm like two and a half, three weeks is what my process is. But I did it with within a week of the launch day. I had 150 reviews from readers all around the world who wow. were posting the reviews on Amazon. And even the the folks who sort of first gave me the idea to do this were blown away by my own outcomes because they'd never seen anyone like, you know, 10x that process 
turn the dial to 11, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so I got really excited about that. And then I followed a similar process when my TEDx talk came out in January of 2020, which again was about in-person networking. So I focused on getting 100 comments, a thousand views, and I was poised to be an overnight success 10 years in the making. And then, you know, David, two months later, no one needed to know about networking at events. It was March 2020. Oh, we were no. all at home. Yeah. Mm. So I I swiftly reinvented myself. I wrote a, a blog post, nine ways to network in a pandemic. And number three was to host a virtual happy hour. And that's how I came to host my first virtual happy hour on March 13th, 2020 which was the Friday that we all kind of went, what's going on here? Um, by the by, a month later, I had announced uh, that I was going to be hosting a weekly free event called No More Bad Zoom Virtual Happy Hour. And I announced the pilot of a four-week program. And I ran that program four times in four months. It became a certification program. And by the fall, people were hiring me as a virtual event design consultant and an executive Zoom producer. So my second book is about how I did that how I built an audience before I tried to sell the offer. And finally, finally, on the third anniversary, March 13th, 2023, my third book came out, which is Break Out of Boredom, Low-Tech Solutions for Highly Engaging Zoom Events. It's basically everything I learned about using Zoom to create dynamic, engaging, and transformative events in the previous three years. So wow. now I'm known for my book launches. And my, my mentor said to me last fall, why are you not a book launch coach? Because I kind of been doing a little bit on the side, and finally I was like, "Huh, hmm. what?" And then that led to me deciding I needed a referral network. Started doing some research calls, testing whether my process was unique, whether a referral network existed, and I basically found out within a month I needed to build the referral network. <laughs> and so the Bizbook Publishing Hub was born earlier this year, and we now have over fifty experts ready to help entrepreneurs navigate the complexities of writing, editing, publishing, and marketing a book. And there's tons of programming that we do alongside that. So I don't know. My, I, st I still struggle to say, like, you know, I'm a writer, but I'm very clearly an author. And I'm very proud of having done that. And I love helping other people accomplish that as well. I don't think you could have planned that path, like, in <laughs> advance. You go, you know, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to jump over here, and then I'm going to do this. There's no way you could have actually planned that out. No, in fact, my dad told me when I was 20, he read this article in the Sunday magazine that said um, between 20 and 40, uh, 20 year olds will have four careers. And he says that quote to me when I'm 20 years old, 30 years ago, by the way. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I bet you, like, I didn't have the term transferable skills in my head. Like, I didn't know that word, but I was thinking, like, I bet you they all kind of build off each other. Whoa, there could be something I do that doesn't even exist yet. Like I actually had that like now back in that time, things were not rapidly growing like they are today, but it still dawned on me. And so, yeah, very clearly that was true for the first 20 years of my career. Mm. But in the last 10, wow, <laughs> wow, you just kind of follow the path. And I also haven't really let go of my other um, careers. So. My initial work was around networking in person, teaching people how to do that, teaching people how to design engaging events for conferences. And in 22, in the fall, NPR, one of their podcasts reached out to me because of my TEDx talk, the one that, you know, went kind of moot uh, yeah. very quickly. Because it had so many views already and so many comments, when it sort of became relevant again, they stumbled upon it. And then I was on NPR and then my message around in-person networking was being blasted globally, like around the world. People were talking about my croissants versus bagels concept, which we're going to have to define here because people mm. are scratching their heads. Well, so when you walk yeah. into a networking event, people are often standing in those tight clusters, those shoulder to shoulder bagels yep. that are impossible to break into. Yep, uh, That's the bagel. But if one person in the circle shifts their body language to make space for others to join, yeah. now you have a, Croissant. Oh. And you all from uh, from Canada know from good croissants. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, we have Montreal bagels too. Yes, we have that covered. So, that, okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm going to an event in September. And uh, yeah, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm going to have to have the book read, read and ready to go before I head off to that event so that I can enjoy both the bagels and the croissants and, and have a great experience. Mm -hmm. And then the Amazon small business podcast reached out to me a year later in 23, again, you know, to talk about 
my content from pre-pandemic, you know, about networking in person. So it, it is interesting. I think the, the thing we should be doing is hitting certain milestones, like publishing books, TEDx stages, that kind of thing, podcasts, because that content, even if it's not as relevant for a moment, it's still publicly viewable and searchable and can be found and it still helps you be an authority. And everything I did for the decade trying to work hard to become known as one thing benefited me when I had to shift gears Great. because I didn't have to start from scratch. I had, you know, no one said to me in 2020, wait, is your book on Zoom? Like, you know what I mean? They weren't like, they, they didn't ask that question. They were like, just like, oh, clearly this person knows what they're talking about. I'm going to, I'm going to help, you know, get help from them. So yeah, that's the kind of my, how my, in retrospect, it all makes sense, but no, I would never have planned this out. When we talked about having you on the show, you got, really excited and animated at the idea of talking to new authors. Um, they're here listening to the show. They're looking for any type of direction and help to maybe skip a few of the things that bog down a new author. And you have a lot of great resources for them. I just want to let you go. I wanted to just start talking to them because they're here ready to learn from you. Uh, and you do talk a lot about the whole power of a good review and all of that. Where do we start? Like, how do we help an author today in, in their early journey of of chasing down the dream of writing? You have a lot of great resources. Where do we start? Well, you have that moment when you're writing a book when you realize, wow, this is a, this is a good book. I, yeah. I should have people read this book, right? It's not just about the uh, ticking off a box of publishing a book, but you want people to see it. And you also have to remember the reason you started writing the book was for it to be read. Like, I know that sometimes the, the slog of writing could, I don't know, you could forget that. Um, if it's a business book and it's helping you generate income, then it's really key to figure out along the way, what's the offer that people can be led to after the book? So... I say this because a lot of times business authors aren't that clued in to that. I now find that out. <laughs> um, my first book, I wasn't. I published the first book without a really clear plan for what offer I was going to make. Other than trying to get hired, you know, to help companies. I was like, there is an offer here for individual people. I just don't know what it is. My second book, I actually document what I went through after my first book mm -hmm. to figure that out. So my second book is Small List, Big Results launch a successful offer, no matter the size of your email list. And the basic premise is that no matter how big or small your business email list is, your network is always bigger. And so I had to figure out, you know, what the offer was and go through the piloting stage. And I detail how to do that in that second book through a process called Wake Up Your Network, which helps you discover likely prospects and likely referral partners from within your existing network. This isn't about hiring someone else to go, you know, pitch your book to their list to get reviews. And this is really key because I I, um, I meet with prospective clients all the time. And one got referred to me recently when I went to get on the call with her. I, I saw that she already had 32 reviews, written reviews, not just the ratings on Amazon. So it's kind of surprised because in some ways, like that shows me that she had a process. It's to get it over 20 is not accidental. You have to make an effort. And so I said, well, you know, what's happening? She's well, I need to make money. I haven't been making any money in my business. I really, and I was like, well, all right, well, who are the 32 people that wrote your reviews? Because I'm thinking these are your best leads. And she said, wow, my friends and family, they really came through for me. <laughs> I was like, ah, uh, face bomb. Your friends and family don't have budgets. They're not hiring you. Right. Like, yes, they wrote your reviews, but not truly as helpful as getting into conversations with those likely prospects. So I think that's a big piece of this. And if it's a fiction book or a self-help book or something where it's not directly related to revenue or memoir, then I still would want you to think about who has the audience that if they get excited about you, they could tell all those people about you and your book. Mm. So if you have a travel memoir, like I have a friend who's a travel memoir, she's 87. She traveled to like 187 countries and territories and she's amazing. So, you know, she could go and figure out which organizations would want her to come speak and share a little bit of her story. And then they might buy her book in bulk or they might, you know, encourage their members to buy her book because she was there to bring some stories to life. 
um, book clubs, like what are the book clubs that are out there that would be a great like fit for the story you've written? And then either, you know, now we can all show up virtually so you can show up virtually for a book club. So I just think it's it's not we don't make money from the book selling them one by one. We either make the book turns into revenue because we we're now seen as the authority and we're invited to speak uh, about the story that we've written or yeah. about the the steps that we've documented for other people to follow um, or people want to be coached by us or cons- the consulting is available to us or something. So it's because the book sort of makes us have a bigger platform, but we have to activate the book. So hitting publish is not enough. Now, the thing I really wanted to share with first time authors is I feel that the whole effort to get bestseller on Amazon, particularly if you are hiring people specifically with that goal, I think that whole business is disingenuous at best and bogus at worst. Mm. And I say that as someone who has hit number one bestseller in 30 categories across three different books in four different countries. My last book, Break Out of Boredom, hit number one 18 times across three countries. So I 100% understand the allure of hitting, you know, number one and getting the orange ribbon. But all those books that I've written have over 650 Amazon reviews collectively. My last one has over 250 on its own. Wow. So the the thing that will happen is that little orange ribbon will go away. So there will be no evidence on your book sales page that that ever happened. It could only be there for an hour. I mean, it could be really quick. You may not even get the screenshot. That's how fast it'll go by. Now, what will stay on the book sales page on Amazon forever is the reviews. Yeah. Which is why my process when I work with an author is to help them get 50 plus Amazon reviews from a launch team that is filled with their likely prospects and referral partners because that process means they're going to be in conversation for sometimes six, eight weeks. And by the time we get to the launch party, which is three weeks maybe after we hit publish, we're going to be able to announce the successes of the book, which will likely a byproduct of my process is hitting number one. Like it likely will hit number one, but it's not a guarantee and it's not the goal, but it will all these other things. So I just launched a book um, early this month for somebody and you know, she had 55 reviews on Amazon, 10 more that were not yet on Amazon. Some couldn't get on Amazon because of their Amazon rules, but she's going to get them posted on Goodreads, on LinkedIn recommendations, on social media. So still useful content. And she got two new speaking opportunities before even getting to the launch party. We got to the launch party. She announced this challenge program that she's running. People are signing up to talk to her about that. So she ends the party and has all these people to, talk, to reach back out to. Plus, she can go through her launch team and start doing follow-up calls and research calls or sales calls with all the people who who raised their hand. She had 131 people raise their hand. And so that's, that's success. Success is not the number of books she sold per se or hitting number one on its own. It's collectively that book is attracting the right people and getting her into conversation with the people who are most excited about her work. And I feel like I focus really on the business author piece because that's a smaller subset of nonfiction and which is of course like the smaller piece of the whole writing world, which includes fiction. But my process works across the board. So whether it's a memoir or a novel, it's about building up a readership for this book and reviews will help with that because my wife's a very avid uh, romance reader and other other uh, novels, but mostly romances. And she likes to joke, you know, if, the, if it says, um, you know, one star review, too much smut, she's like, ooh, what's the book? You know, so like one person's yeah. yuck is someone else's yum. Right. And so a review is helpful. It just it just helps people clarify, like, is this book for me? Is this a book I'm going to want to read? So um, I, that's my pitch is just to make sure you really have a clear understanding of how you're going to take this amazing piece of art that you created and get it into the right hands. So the right people are, are hearing your message and being inspired by it. So early in our conversation, you mentioned an email news list, newsletter list um, and having those emails. Um, I'm just anticipating there's a, an author going, wait. I'm supposed to have an email news news like email list like I don't even have that yet. I'm just starting my book, but when do I when do I build my email list? Like, what's your advice? 
So the good news is you don't actually need one to get started because as I said, no matter how big or small your email list is, your network is always larger. Yeah. So when I'm talking to you about how to discover the people to reach out to who are likely prospects and referral partners, it's a place I often start is LinkedIn. Okay. Because if you're a professional in the world and you've been sort of doing this for the last 10, 15 years, you're going to probably have several hundred, if not several thousand uh, people that you're connected to on LinkedIn. And even if you have not been active, you know, it will it'll still remind you of certain pockets of people that you could be reaching out to and other lists so like, oh, an alumni group I'm part of. Oh, right. I forgot about that. So it's a it's a process. And in fact, if you go to smalllistbigresults.com, which is the site for my second book, there are resources you can download even before buying the book. And and in those resources is the Wake Up Your Network workbook, which just really walks you through the, the process. Now, if you create a lead magnet, which for a fiction author might be like chapter one, right? A little teaser chapter. Yeah. Uh, for a nonfiction author, or particularly a business author, it could be a checklist, a resource, right? It could be, it could be I mean, for me, I have so many tools that I, I zip them up into a zip file and I just, I add things as I think of it. Yeah. Um, so, but having that kind of opt-in mess, uh, lead magnet resource, that's how you build a good list because having a list and having an actively engaged list are two different things. Right. So if you don't yet have a list, get clarity about the kind of people you want to attract, create the resource that would kind of attract their attention and then create that opt-in experience. So now they're part of it. Now, once you have them, now we should be thinking about like, how do we welcome them in? Um, remembering to write to them, <laughs> invite them along a journey with you. And to continue, like for me, one of the things I did as a to practice my writing skills, for several years, I wrote a newsletter that was a story with a little bit of a twist. Hmm. So maybe 400 words. Um, and in those 400 words, I opened with a non sequitur, like where is Robbie going kind of story. Yeah. And in the very end, there's a twist which leads you to a business or life lesson. And then below that, I had sort of here are three or four things you can do this week, you know, in relation to that lesson, like next steps for you. And I got the best responses from people, people saying like, you're in my head, are you reading my journal? That's exactly what I was wondering about this week. Wow. And it was really just based on my own observation. I either had a message that I wanted to send and then I was like, okay, what can I use as the hook to just talk about that? Or my kids would do something funny and I'd then turn that into the business lesson. I'd be like, oh yeah, like that, I can turn that whole experience into, into a, a different lesson. So, but just like the practice of writing that kind of newsletter it doesn't have to always be serious. Like I'm on a podcast. Like I feel like some newsletters when you first get started, you're like, what am I going to tell people? Yeah. Am I just announcing like, you know, where's Waldo? Yeah, <laughs> <It's> like, right. <laughs> so, you know, even though my stories didn't, I didn't have anything I was selling per se, but it did help me engage and get some really good. I My open rates are actually higher now, but my response rate, my reply rate was much higher when I was doing storytelling. I had awesome people and conversations we would get back and forth in. And I think if you're trying to develop relationships, that's a great place to start. I love it. I love it. One of the things I encourage on this podcast when all of my authors come on is I try to take a little side tangent to kind of talk to the audience and go, listen, when you buy the book, leave a detailed review of the book. Not great author, great book. But some detail that's going to help people. If I go, if I want to go to take my wife out for dinner, I'm going to read the reviews of the local restaurants and try to find the thing that's going to be that's going to suit us for our plans for that evening. So those right. reviews really do count. So to the readers that are listening to this, a little yeah. step aside from the authors for a second, to the readers that are listening to this, can you please help reinforce the fact that they really do have a say in how all of this works to benefit the authors? Like what makes yeah. a great review on, 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 for the reader? Like how can we do I'm this loving better? this question. I love this question. There are three prompts that I think we should all use as a, at a minimum. Yep. And I do think prompts help as authors. So authors, you can help your readers. Um, the back of all of my books, I have a page that says uh, that I'm asking for a review that spells out the three prompts. And uh, when I have a, a launch team and I'm guiding them through the process, 
Um, I actually do something where I give them the advanced reader copy, the ARC. I give them a Google form with the three prompts and I ask them to send me the review back via the Google form. This is before the book's even published. When the book's published, I then send them back their review text with the instructions for how to post it. So a lot of hand-holding to get people to actually follow through. But here are the three prompts at a minimum. Uh, what is something that, like, what's your biggest takeaway, really, from the from the book? What's your biggest aha or takeaway or wow? What is something you're going to do differently because of this book? And who should read this book? So those are really geared towards business books or, like, self-help books or even memoirs. Like, where, where it's, you know, really, you, like, had an experience reading this. You're like, whoa. So I have, again, I told you, my friend who wrote that book around um, traveling and, you know, again, it's a non, it's a, it's a memoir, but I was like, wow, I've always talked about how much I want to travel. And I also realized like, I am not as courageous as she is. <laughs> like what I kept noticing was all of her near death experiences, which was not the focus of her book, but it's what I kept taking away. was like, <laughs> wow, she was really, but she had so many amazing experiences and I had her on my podcast and she'd said like, life's worth living, like we're all gonna go one day, you know? And I, and it's just like, I was profoundly moved by her sort of tenacity and bravery and and like willingness to kind of just go and live. And it makes me think on any scale that I can do that, I need to do that every day. And I think anyone who wants a little bit of inspiration should read that kind of book. So this is to me, what would help people get an understanding of what is, what is this book about? Um, by the way, her name is Joyce Perrin, P-E-R-R-I-N. And her book is called Ants in My Pants, which is her travel memoir. Um, she, she, you'd love her on your show, by the way, because yeah, she, at in her late 50s, um, like closed up shop. She was a CEO of a, um, a Canadian healthcare company. I know you love have Canadians on. She go. was like one of the, I think she was the first female CEO of a healthcare um, institution in Canada. And so she leaves that job, puts her stuff in storage, not knowing it's going to be basically 30 years later that she'll be taking it out <laughs> and then goes and, and just travels the world. And now she's in her late eighties and has written this book and is speaking about it. Um, so I, I love that because it's something I can share. The other takeaway for me from reading that book was I should read more memoirs because mm-hmm. I don't think I had an appreciation for that art form. And so my, so now here I am, I'm a reader My passion for her book, even though it was not a have to read, you know, it wasn't like a for my business read, right? It was a for fun read because I wanted to support her. I'm now talking her up in other places. That's what you want your readers to do, authors. (laughs) You want to create an experience where they are so enthusiastically talking about your stuff that, that your message is spreading, whether it's your romance novel or your novel, or, you know, your action adventure story, or whatever it is, like, you want people to be like, Oh, my gosh, you have to read this, right? Um, That, but what helps in the review process is, why is this good for you? Now, I will give you one other sort of the opposite example. So I do collect these reviews in advance. And I had someone love my first book, but he didn't love my second book. Now, my first book was about networking at conferences. And it was perfect for what he does in life. My second book is geared towards, I would say, entrepreneurial women in their 50s and beyond who are looking to grow their impact and income through a new revenue stream. That tends to be who I attract for my coaching work. It's not exclusive. I also say, parenthetically, a few good men. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but he he's not like in his 50s. He's not entrepreneurial. He's in a business, not a woman. And so he didn't love my second book. And so I said hey, could you, I don't care how many stars you give it. Like, that's cool. I actually think a three-star review would really stand out and people would read it, right? Mm. Could you give some context (laughs) for what, like who you are and like why this wasn't a fit? So the resulting review actually make a really strong case for who should buy the book and why it wasn't for him. And that is a better review than, you know, I'd, this is this review is not helpful. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> like he was just like, this book's not great. Like that's not as helpful a book as he was like, I loved Robbie's first book. I was eager to read his second book, but you know, I don't have a business that I'm growing. 
So while I had a few things I could learn from this, I think the people who should definitely read this are people who own businesses. Nice. Like much better review. And it was a three-star review. So everyone goes and reads the three-star review, which right. just reinforced that this is a good book for business owners. And so it makes the for other readers be like, oh, this is helpful. Like I should, if I'm a business owner, I should read this book. If I'm not, then I'll probably feel like this guy and I shouldn't. Just like your wife's looking at that one review around a romance novel and goes, hey, wait, this exactly. is the book for me. Just from seeing that, that's what I love. Because when I go and see a wall of five-star reviews on any product or service or a book or anything on Amazon, for example, everybody's praising this thing. I'm like, okay, like, is it really perfect? Like, nobody here is going, hang on, it wasn't good, it didn't work, it wasn't what I liked, it, came, it was it was not what, as advertised, whatever. I want something to counterbalance a sea of five-star reviews. And I know we love five-star reviews, we say it on podcasts all the time, right? Leave us a five-star review, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but where are the, I love looking at the three stars, because then it gives you a sense of maybe what could have been better, or who it was for, yeah. or... I love that you brought that I'm up. actually looking at my last book because I told you I have over 250 reviews. And uh, I, I have, um, there's there's a there's a one-star written review, um, <laughs> biased and irrelevant content that the subtitle, the title is Wokeness at its Best. Oh, so wow. we, we clearly know that, that person's okay. politics. Um, <laughs> but there are only six four-star reviews. The rest are all five-star I, you know, you, you, I don't guide people towards what stars no. to put. Yeah. I actually, the review content is more important to me than anything else. I'm a little stumped by the value that Amazon gave to giving people the ability to rate with stars without writing a written right. review. Yeah, I don't Because get that. now anybody could go and just like, you know, put a one star, two star, three star, whatever. I don't know. I'm not sure why they must have had lots of reasons for it. But but to me, as an author, it means you have to work really hard to get those written reviews because those written reviews were counterbalanced. Even if you're if you have lots of written reviews, but you've got a bunch of people who hit the one star and that's all they did, people will filter that out in their brain. And and Amazon may even come in and realize there's an issue here. Um, I know that happens with Yelp. Like if you yeah. know you, if people attack a business on Yelp. Um, Yelp will come in and, and clean that up after the fact. Yeah. So uh, I, I really think the written part is so key. And so giving people some prompts to do that is is really, really helpful. And then notice that I didn't just send them to the page and tell them to do it. Most readers aren't in the habit of writing reviews for anything, hmm. not just books, like for anything. And as much as we love reviews, there's a small percentage of people who are elite reviewers, <laughs> right? Most people just read them. So breaking down that process into let's get the right people on the launch team, give them early access to the book, give them some prompts and a deadline to write the review, send the review to you. Now the review is published, send the review back to them with steps on how to publish it and really nurture them and remind them and encourage them along the way. That's, that's sort of my process. And even with that, here's the truth. If I want 50 reviews, sort of in that, you know, near term, like with really specific deadline, yeah. I need 150 people to say yes to being on the launch team. Wow. Three times as many people, even though my process is, you know, they're not just saying yes, they're filling out a form to say yes. Like they're, they're answering questions about where they are in the world. So I know which Amazon site, you know, there's a lot they're, they're saying it's a very intentional. Yes. And even with the intentional, yes, life happens. This is not as critical or important to you the reader as it is to the author. So it's up to the author to nurture them through it. I've been on so many launch teams where the entire interaction of the author is, will you be on my launch team? Yes. And that's literally it. That's it. Like, <laughs> that's it. Okay. And then I have this like vague notion that I should be doing something for you. Yeah. What am I supposed to do right yeah, now? And then yeah. I start feeling bad. Like, did I forget to do something for you? I'm, so this is really like, it's on us as authors to have a system to be organized. And then I really love the virtual book launch party. Again, my background is Zoom. I'm the Zoom guy. Mm. So I love this because we design it to give the author the, you know, the guest expert, the guest of honor experience. We bring in, because these are all business authors, we bring in people who have experienced working with the author in some capacity to say nice things about them. Um, 
the author gets to say all their thank yous. I tell them they have three minutes. This is a very funny note about first time authors. I'm like, it's a, it's like a 75 minute program. You know, I'm like, oh, by the way, you get three minutes to say your thank yous. Like you cannot spend the entire time being like, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. <gasps> Can you believe I did this? Oh my God, I'm an author. Like you can't, <laughs> no, no. like you get yeah. three minutes to say, you know, your thank yous and to say like how, the, how well the book did. <laughs> and then I do the plea for reviews and just acknowledge how many we've already had and how important reviews are as the MC and the fellow author. And that leaves the author to talk about what's next and how do we stay connected and then they end up with a list of people who raise their hand who want to continue the conversation. So to me, having that entire experience of the pipeline sort of designed and thought out in your head before you even gets too far down. I, I will give you another example of an author I just talked to. We just we just signed together. She talked to me yesterday. She just wants to write a book about um, helping people get certified as in, in the States and also in Canada, you can become certified as a, a minority business owner, women owned business, LGBT owned business. So she wants to help people do that. But it's kind of a boring book. Even she was like, this is a really boring how-to book. I'm copying and pasting content from other sites. It's dull. It, you know. And I said, well, what do people do with these certifications once they have them? She goes, never enough. I'm like, oh, talk about that. She's like, oh my God, people can do so much more with this. Sort of I'm like, well, that's a whole different audience. Why didn't you write that book about all the stories of success and, and walk people through what they can do and leverage? And if people want help getting the certifications, they're going to come to you. And then you can help provide the service to help them get. She was like, oh, I much want to write. I want to write that book. Hmm. So sometimes we need another perspective to help us see how do we even define the audience for the work that we're doing. So now, now there's like three or four possible offers that she could have at the end of this, like a mastermind, a coaching program, yeah. like a, a, a concierge level, like we're going to do everything for you. There's like all these cool things that she can do for people once she attracts them in. And it's also a less crowded like market space compared to all the people who are helping people get those certifications. If she helps them leverage certifications, not as many people uh, doing that. So that's where I think finding the right resources, which is why I built the BizBook Publishing Hub, which is everything from writing, editing, publishing, and marketing, over 50 experts. You know, you can come, it's free, bizbookpublishinghub.com. You can go and check it out. And every two months we host a virtual networking event for writers and authors to nice. meet each other and to meet our hub experts. And uh, and then twice a year around Prime Day and around Black Friday, I organize the Kindle cross promotion campaign where we have business authors lowering the price of their Kindle books to 99 cents. And then we cross promote um, our books and I create a whole page for that. And then the people who sign up to be a VIP for that uh, we're going to be part of the author panel that I will be interviewing them uh, live stream and then resharing that on the BizBook Publishing Hub podcast, talking about the ROI of writing business books. So you can see how it all, and I'm we're probably going to organize a giveaway later this year as well, like pick 20 people who've got great, you know, freebie gifts and just organize a giveaway around that. We'll do that a few times a year. So for a thing that like last October didn't exist for me, and it's now as June when we're, we're talking, um, you know, I've created a whole ecosystem around this and it's wonderful because I'm attracting so many amazing, talented people. The only thing that would make this better, Robbie, is if you actually put some passion behind this. Like I don't get any passion from you at all in this. You're just light you're lighting up as you talk about all these great things to help authors. I I love this. So a little tongue in cheek there, but my gosh, there's I, I was warning the, the authors listening at the beginning, you you're gonna want to definitely check out Robbie's site. You mentioned a podcast, and my ears perk up perk up because I love anything podcasting. Uh, you have a current podcast and something else in the works. Can you give us? Yeah, an so update on the it? schmooze is my current podcast, which um, I'm about to mark eight years of wow. it being published. Nine years that I started working on it. So I started working on it in um, the summer of 2015, and it was published in summer of 2016. And in between, my first kid was born, so I gave myself some time off, but. Um, it's been wonderful and I did it consistently 50 times a year uh, up until this year. And then this year I decided to do every other week and I would republish archived episodes the opposite weeks because I had just so much content. There's this point where more content wasn't necessary. It wasn't gonna be like that much more impressive to have 50 more versus 25 more a year later. But it also gave me some space to create the BizBook Publishing Hub. And some of the hub partners, the experts said, oh, we should be doing more together. Can we do some events, maybe a summit? 
I'm not a big fan of the summit model. I feel like it really benefits the person organizing the summit, mm. not as much the person who's speaking at the summit, who's being asked to promote it. I, I haven't gotten that many leads from summits compared to other opportunities. And the people attending don't have time to go through all that content that's just flooded into their inbox or if they're told to go live for two days. Like we just don't have that kind of life right now. So I was like, oh, I want to get more content out there. And I'm like, ah, podcast. I could, I could totally, I mean, yeah. And that way it's just like steady drip. So I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to start interviewing the experts on my original show on the schmooze. And I'm going to get them to talk about sort of how they came to, to do the work they're doing, what they do for authors and what advice they have for writers and authors. And then, cause I want to keep that show going and I'd like to be able to like have random people in who aren't necessarily connected to the author world. Hmm. Uh, and then the Bizbook Publishing Hub is going to be featuring authors talking about the ROI of writing a book, what what strategies and techniques and processes they did to to turn their book into something that was truly helpful to the business they were running. And I just think that's going to be a really interesting conversation to be listening in on. Um, so those episodes are going to be coming out on the Bizbook Publishing Hub podcast. Amazing. I love it. Um, we could talk to you all day, Robbie. Uh, I know you have other things to do. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show. I, I feels like this is a part one. Like, I'd love to have you back in the future to get updates and kind of, you know, reconnect and give more value to the authors that are listening. You've given a lot already, but I feel like we haven't touched on the bulk of it. There's so much more we can talk about. So, Keep me in mind. I'd love you to come back in the future when we can make it work. But um, as far as your your main place you want to send everybody, as we kind of wrap up here, where should we go? Where should we where should we head? My website has everything. So I'm a multi passionate entrepreneur. I do a lot of different things. I wear a lot of different hats. I even have a little explainer note on my homepage of my website. You may know me for one thing, and here's all the other things you didn't know about. So RobbieSamuels.com is the place to go. You'll find all my podcasts, my TEDx, my books, my programs, Facebook Publishing Hub, also my Content and Connection Club, which is something I organized with Masterminds a Weekly, Coworking Weekly, a Business Book Club. It's a less expensive way in to the world of masterminding. It's just $100 a month, half going to charity. So this everything is all housed at robbysamuels.com because ultimately I am the connection <laughs> between all the things and really the through line for all the work that I do, regardless of the modality or the medium is relationships and connecting and inclusion and belonging. Um, so I'm excited to meet some of your listeners and have them say hello. And if they're on LinkedIn, please send me a connection request, mention that you met, saw me on the show and leave a comment on this show about what you got, what kind of value you got out of it. Like reviews matter. Content creators love when you hit reply and tell them something. They love it even more when you send send that message in a public way as a LinkedIn recommendation or a podcast review or a book review. You could really bolster our spirits and get us yeah. to keep putting out great content. So thanks for inviting me in the show. I would love to come back. And uh, I just, I think you're great at what you're doing and I can't believe how many shows you juggle. So well done you. Yeah. Awesome. Robbie, thank you so much for being on the podcast, everyone. All the information is always in the show notes. And when you buy Robbie's books, please leave a detailed, amazing review following the information you've been given today on the podcast so that more people fall in love with what Robbie's putting out in the world because it helps a lot of people. And we want to do that. We want to encourage Robbie to do more for us as if he hasn't done enough already. Do more and more and more. Robbie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. Hey, thanks for being here for the Living in the Next Chapter podcast. So glad to have you as part of our family of listeners. There's a seat for you just here on Living in the Next Chapter, and I'm so happy that you have listened to all the way to the end. Wow, you are now my new bestie. I want to let you know that I host seven other podcasts on top of Living in the Next Chapter. Yep, eight total. One of them is called the How To Podcast Series. If you are thinking, you know what, Dave, this podcast thing seems like a lot of fun. Well, I'll give you a secret. It is. It's a great, amazing, fun time where you can get to meet great people, 
get your word out there, promote your book, promote with your coaching program, whatever you're doing. Podcasting is great. And if you want to learn how to do this, what you're hearing right now, head over to howtopodcast.ca and look up the How to Podcast series on YouTube, whatever app you're listening on, you'll find me there. And I'd love for you to come listen to How to Do This. And if you're interested and have questions on how to podcast, reach out to me at howtopodcast.ca. Thank you for listening. Talk soon.